Hey folks, uh, let's all give a round of applause for Carl Meyer, who is here to talk to us about Type Tech Python in the real world. Thank you, Rami. Welcome to the final uh, session of talks at PyCon 2018. I hope that after three days of PyCon and three nights of enjoying the best of Cleveland, you're all awake enough to uh, process some Python code on slides, because we're going to see a lot of it in the next half hour. I'm Carl Meyer. I work in Instagram server core infrastructure. And uh, I'm um, uh, here to talk about type check Python. So if you've seen me around the internet, I probably look like this. Uh, this is me and my sister prototyping some eyewear designs of our own creation that never took off. I'm Carl JM, pretty much everywhere on the internet. I've been writing Python code now since the, well, since before the turn of the millennium, which I'm fairly sure makes me officially old. For the last couple of years, I've been working at Instagram, most recently on adding uh, type checking, type annotations to our server code base. So rough plan for the next half hour. We'll talk a little bit about why you might want to type your Python code. Uh, we'll go into how you would go about it, uh, a sort of a brief tour of Python's type system. And lastly, we'll talk about gradual typing, uh, what it means and why it matters. So why type your Python code? Uh, if some of you in here are coming from a static typing background, you might have the opposite question, like uh, how is Python even usable without static typing? But since we're at PyCon, uh, we'll take the question from the opposite side. Uh, I've been using Python for years, it's fine. Why do I care? Why do I need type annotations? So in this method, uh, process method on some class, it takes an items argument. What is items? In Python, we have this idea of duck typing. If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it may as well be a duck. So we can give a duck typing answer to our question, what is items? Items is some collection that we can iterate over. Each item in the collection should have a value attribute, which itself should have an ID attribute. That's great. That's a very flexible answer to the question. It could allow us to reuse this process method in various contexts, pass at different kinds of collections, maybe even containing different kinds of objects, as long as they all conform to this contract. Uh, with the type in, um, the, the problem with this, though, is uh, code is written once, but maintained for a long time. So what if I come back to this code in six months? and I've forgotten everything I knew when I wrote it. The contract that we just described, I have to reestablish by reading through every line of code in the function line by line. It's entirely implicit. Uh, or what if, how do I know that I'm conforming to this contract everywhere in my code base? Maybe somewhere in some dark corner I'm passing in some object where its value attribute could in some cases be none, and then I'm gonna get an attribute error. How would I catch that? Or maybe I need to add some new functionality to this function. Uh, I have a new requirement. I want to access a new attribute on my items. How do I know that everywhere that I'm currently passing in objects to this function, that they have this new attribute? If I have a large code base, in some cases answering that question uh, satisfactorily could require digging through layers and layers of code, not only the call sites of this method, but perhaps their call sites and their call sites until I track down the origin of the collection that ultimately is getting passed to this uh, method. With a type annotation, all of that goes away. Now I know exactly what I can expect to receive, a sequence of this particular item class. I can go directly to the class, I know where it is, I can see what attributes and methods it has. This is nothing new, of course. People have been putting the same information into doc strings for years. Uh, or into comments. There's multiple standards even, epydoc and others, for how you can represent argument and return types uh, in your doc strings in Python. So it's clearly uh, useful information for maintainers. The problem with the doc string annotation is that at some point it's guaranteed that someone will update the signature of the function and forget to update the doc string, at which point it's obsolete and arguably worse than, uh, uh, worse than useless. Whereas this type annotation can automatically be checked for correctness, so it has to remain up to date with the code. So I, I can almost hear someone in the room thinking, that's great, but I don't need it. I could catch those things with a test. Uh, 
which is great. I love tests. I've written a lot of tests. I've given Python talks on writing tests in Python. There's this trope of the dynamic language programmer claiming they don't need static types because they write tests, or the static typing programmer claiming they don't need to write tests because the compiler catches all of their bugs. Both are right, and both are, of course, wrong. If we imagine a two-argument function, and this plot is the space of all possible inputs to the function, so one argument on the x-axis, one on the y-axis, we have the space of all possible arguments. If we write a test case, it's a single example. We give two argument values, one for each argument. We assert the correct return value. We've covered exactly one point in this plot. Typically, we write test cases for a variety of points on this plot that we think or hope or maybe even know are representative of the space of possible inputs that we think we care about. Maybe if we're especially clever, we can write a parameterized test case, cover a whole range of inputs uh, with a single test, maybe even a quick check style or property-based test, cover an even wider array of possible inputs. With type annotations, we can add just a few characters to our function definition and instantly eliminate entire swathes of this area to cover. I annotate that my function takes two integers and all of this area out here for all the possible strings and lists and dictionaries uh, is, is eliminated. I can focus all my testing effort on ensuring correctness with high granularity uh, in this area where it really matters, uh, where even the best type system can't fully ensure correctness. So let's say I've convinced you and you want to start type checking your Python. How do you make it happen? Let's take a little tour of what typing looks like in Python. So we have a simple function, a square function. It takes an integer, returns an integer, the square of the argument. We've seen the syntax for this in previous slides. After each argument, we can have a colon and then the type. After the argument list, we can have an arrow and then the return type. So let's call the function a few times. Uh, we'll take the square of three. We'll take the square of a string. Uh, just for kicks, we'll take the square of four and then add it to a string. Now let's try type checking this code. Uh, we'll pip install MyPy. Uh, MyPy is an open source Python type checker written and maintained by a team at Dropbox. Uh, it's the, by far today the most commonly used Python type checker, so we'll use it in our examples for this talk. So let's run MyPy on our file, and we get a couple of type errors. Let's dig into them a little bit. Uh, we get an, one type error because we tried to pass in a string where an integer is expected, and another type error because we tried to add an integer, the annotated return type of the square function, uh, to a string, which is a type error in Python. And we got both of those errors without having to set up any kind of test harness or write any kind of test case that would exercise this code, just by running a static analyzer uh, over the code. So the type checker asks us to annotate our function signatures in order to validate our assumptions about input and output types. In between, there's a lot it can infer. For instance, uh, in this class, because it knows that the, we've told it that the type of the width and height arguments to the initializer are both integers, uh, it can infer through the assignments to self and understand that every uh, photo instance uh, will have a width and a height attribute that are integers. And if we in another method, we try to return self.width and self.height and claim that they're a tuple of strings, the type checker can catch that and tell us, no, that's a tuple of, of integers. We can also infer the types of containers. If we create a list of uh, photo objects, uh, try to append a string to it, the type checker will tell us, hey, maybe that's not what you intended to do. This is, of course, the type checker being a little bit opinionated. Uh, in Python, it's perfectly legal to have a heterogeneous list, but the type checker assumes that if we initialized it with a homogeneous set of objects, that probably that's what we intended, uh, and it was probably a mistake to add a different type. We can use an explicit type annotation if we want to give a broader type to the list. In some cases, uh, type inference won't be enough to understand the type of every variable. For instance, if we create an empty container, the type checker doesn't know what we intend to put into it, so it asks us to be explicit. Uh, we can add a type annotation for the variable like this and say, this is intended to be a list of strings, then the type checker is happy. This particular syntax, uh, with a colon after the variable name, then the type annotation before the equals sign, is new in Python 3.6. If you're on an older version, there's an alternative comment-based syntax you can use. I won't go over it here, but it's in the documentation. 
So that's pretty much the basics. Uh, to review what we've covered, mostly you want to annotate your function signatures, the arguments and the return values. And occasionally you might have to annotate a variable, but usually you only want to do this if the type checker asks you to. Uh, otherwise, you'll end up with a bunch of redundant variable annotations for things the type checker could have inferred correctly anyway. So let's go a little deeper. Sometimes we write functions that can take or return more than one type. Uh, we can handle this, the simplest way to handle this is with a union type. So for this function, it can return a foo or a bar, so we annotate the return type as a union of foo and bar. That means it could return either a foo or a bar. Very common case of this is a function that can return something or none. It's so common, in fact, that there's a, a special um, form for that. Uh, optional foo means the same thing as union of foo and none. This function could return a foo or it could return a none. So here we have a function get foo that takes a foo ID, uh, which is an optional integer, either an integer or none, and returns an optional foo, either a foo or none. So let's get a foo instance, my foo, and let's access its ID. Oops, we have a type error. Because we told the type checker that this function could return none, and we didn't check whether my foo was in fact a none, so accessing the ID attribute could be an attribute error at runtime, so we get an error from the type checker. This illustrates why you want to avoid using unions and optionals, particularly as return types, uh, because every time if your function returns a union or an optional, every caller has to uh, check what they got back before they can safely make use of the return value. In this case, though, that's a sad outcome. If we look at the code for get foo, we can see that if we give it a none, it will always return none. If we give it an integer, it will always return a foo. Uh, so we know that, but the type checker doesn't. So even though we call it with an integer, the type checker thinks the return value might be none. And this is gonna cause us to have to add uh, extra redundant checks into our code that are useless at runtime just to satisfy the type checker. There's a better option in this case. Using the overload decorator from the typing module, we can give the type checker more information about the invariance of our function. For instance, we can say, uh, overload allows a kind of pattern matching uh, similar to overloaded functions in other languages. So you can say, in this case, if foo ID is none, then the return value will always be none. If foo ID is an integer, the return type will always be foo. And then lastly, we give the actual definition of get foo. Now it's important to note that there's nothing, uh, there's no kind of uh, dynamic dispatch or anything happening here at runtime. This is purely additional information for the type checker. At runtime, the only thing that's used is the final definition of get foo. That's why the other two don't need a body, they can just use pass. They're just additional information for the type checker to better understand the type invariants that are actually implemented by the function. So with this definition, if we call get foo none, the type checker will understand that the return value is none, and if we call get foo with an integer, it will understand that the return value is a foo, and so we won't have to check before we access its ID attribute or whatever else. Another way that we can make the type checker smarter about uh, understanding our code is generic functions. So uh, to define a generic function, uh, we can define a type variable, which is like a placeholder for a type. So here we define a type variable called any string, which uh, is a placeholder for either string or bytes. Type variables can be unbounded, uh, wh where they could match any type, or in this case, this type variable is uh, as a bound of string and bytes. So we can define a concatenate function that takes to any string and returns an any string, and then concatenates them and returns the result. Now this is different from using a union of string and bytes because the type checker will ensure that the type variable is, uh, binds to the same type uh, throughout any, uh, any call to the function. So it will give us a type error if we try to call concat with a string and a bytes, which is good because adding a string to a bytes is a type error. And of course, because the type variable is bound, it will also give us a type error if we try to call concat with two objects that are neither string nor bytes. And perhaps most importantly, if we concatenate two strings together, the type checker will understand that the return value must be a string, not a string or a bytes. And similarly with bytes, we concatenate two bytes, we definitely get a bytes back. <laughs> 
Uh, in fact, this any string type variable is useful enough uh, for defining functions that can handle strings or bytes that it's built into the typing module. We don't need to define it ourselves. We can just import it. So to review, again, we uh, can use unions and optionals, uh, but sparingly. And overloads and generics allow us to te the, teach the type checker more about the invariance of our type signatures. Uh, compared to using unions or optionals, uh, generics or overloads can make your functions much more usable for callers without needing redundant checks. So at this point, somebody might be wondering, what about my ducks? I like duck typing. In this new type safe world, how do I write a function that can take any type at all, as long as it has the right methods and attributes? For instance, maybe I want to define a render a function that can take an object and will call its render method, any object that defines a render method, no matter its type. This is actually similar to a number of built-in uh, protocols in Python. For instance, the len uh, function, the len built-in, will call the dunder len method on, on any object, or the next built-in will call dunder next, et cetera. So how can I type this? We could try to use object, since we know that every object, every type in Python uh, is a subtype of object. But this won't work. Object has no attribute render. Or we could try to use the any type. The any type is a sort of escape hatch the typing system provides. The any type is compatible with anything. In type system terms, it's both the top type and a bottom type. It's a subtype and a supertype of everything. Or you could think of it as it has every attribute and method. Basically, it will never cause a type error. This makes our function type check OK, but it's a bit sad because now we can pass in something that doesn't have a render method, which will throw an error at runtime, but the type checker won't catch it. These are the kinds of bugs we want our type checker to catch for us. So I mentioned that this, uh, this pattern is similar to built-in protocols in Python, and the type system solution for it is also called protocol. It's still technically experimental. You have to pip install typing extensions and import it from typing extensions. Uh, but in practice, it's very unlikely to change and will soon be in the built-in typing module. So if we import protocol, we can define renderable as a subclass of protocol and give it a render method. We don't need to provide a body for the method. All we're giving here is an interface. Uh, what matters is the attributes and their types and the methods and their type signatures. So once we have this protocol defined, we can say that our render method takes an object of type renderable and then if we have some random class, which has no explicit relationship to renderable, simply because it has a render method with the correct signature, the type checker will accept this call. It will allow us to pass a foo object to a render method because it sees that it matches the protocol. If we try to pass some other object without a render method, we'll get a type error. So this is exactly what we want. And we found our duck. You might hear this feature uh, also referred to as structural subtyping. So with a uh, typical inheritance, uh, we have nominal subtyping because if foo inherits bar, we've named our supertype bar. So that's nominal subtyping. With structural subtyping, foo is a subtype of renderable because it matches the structure of renderable. It has the same attributes and methods. So that's structural subtyping. So strict static typing tends to be really good for like 90 to 95% of your code that's pretty straightforward. It's not doing anything too dynamic. Um, if you're writing production code or production application, you probably want most of your code to be like this because it's also going to be easier for your coworkers to read and maintain. But there may still be those few cases where you really do want to take advantage of Python's dynamic nature. You really do want to meta class or to generate a bunch of classes on the fly or whatever other off the wall thing you might be doing. Or like us at Instagram, you may have a lot of legacy code that was written long before type checking existed. And you need to con continue supporting that code even if it's doing some things that don't quite fit into the static typing world. So Python's type system feels that pain and provides some escape patches that you can use when you really just need to tell the type checker to go take a hike. So the first one we already saw, it's the any type. One sample case where you might use the any type is some kind of get attribute wrapping proxy, where you're wrapping some object and proxying every attribute access. You have no idea what you might be proxying or what attributes it might have or what their types are. So maybe the best you can do is just say that your proxy returns any from its get attribute. It's not great because it means you lose all the benefits of type checking, 
uh, on those wrapped objects, but in some cases it may be the best option you have. A second escape hatch is the cast function. It basically lets you lie to the type checker about the type of some expression. So for example, at Instagram we have a configuration system and we can get a configuration value by key and basically they're JSON structs, they're dictionaries or lists or whatever and we don't know what shape any given config var will have. Um, so the best that our get config var function can do is be typed to return any because we don't know what shape of object it might return. But in practice, given a particular config key at some specific call site, we probably do know what the shape of that config key will be, otherwise we wouldn't be able to make use of it. So we can use the cast function to tell the type checker, look, actually, I know this function says it returns any, but in this case, I know it returns a dictionary mapping strings to integers. And the type checker will believe us. So of course, since you're lying to the type checker, you wanna make sure that you're right, because if you lie to the type checker and you're wrong, well, you can expect the type checker to lie right back. The third escape hatch is kind of the nuclear option. Uh, type ignore says, ignore any type error on this line, no matter what the cause. We try to reserve this one for bugs in the type checker or limitations of the type checker that we can't work around any other way. So one example is uh, MyPy currently has a bug where it can't handle a property decorator stacked on top of another decorator. Uh, so we just stick a type ignore on the line where it throws an error, add an explanatory comment linking to the bug, and move on. So if the cast function is a way to lie to the type checker, uh, stub files are how you lie to the type checker at industrial scale. So at Instagram, we use a lot of Cython and uh, C extensions for performance hotspots. And of course, the type checker can't see into any of that code. It can't read Cython syntax. It can't read uh, C code, of course. So it has no idea what uh, functions and classes are in our Cython or C code and uh, what signatures they might have. So for example, say we have a fast math module, compiled module with some fast math functions in it. And um, we if we put those functions in there, it's probably because we call them a lot. And if we call them a lot, we'd really like our calls to them to be type checked, of course. So we can solve this problem by putting a PYI file next to the compiled module. So PYI is Python interface. It's sort of like a C header file, but for Python code. It just provides uh, the type signatures, the interfaces of our functions and classes that are in the compiled module so that the type checker is aware of them. So for instance, our fastmath.pyi, if we had a square function in our compiled module, we could put this, uh, this interface, this uh, definition line in our PYI file, and now the type checker understands that fastmath module has a square function that takes an integer and returns an integer. Similarly, we could put uh, class interfaces in there. Now it knows that we have a complex class uh, with these two attributes of these types. So now the type checker will be able to check the correctness of our uses of those uh, functions and classes. Okay, so that's the end of our tour through Python's type system. Uh, last review here, protocols are statically checked duct typing or structural typing. And uh, then we have a number of escape hatches that we can use if we need to uh, escape from the restrictions of the type checker. We can use any, cast, ignore, stub files. So we've talked about why you might want to type check and how you'd go about type checking. Lastly, what do we mean by gradual typing and what does it matter? We've actually already started talking about gradual typing. So gradual typing just means you can type check your program uh, even though not all expressions in the program are fully typed. So when we look at something like the any type, that's already an example of gradual typing. But we can go beyond that. Gradual typing also allows us to incrementally add type checking to our code base uh, as we're ready to deal with the consequences. So for instance, here's our code base, a bunch of Python modules. Arrows showing dependencies between the modules. We introduce type checking, and this is what we're gonna see. Uh, errors everywhere. It's not because the code is bad, it's just the nature of introducing type checking to a code base that was never type checked before. But this is a problem, we can't deal with this. We have too much code, too much to do. We can't stop the world while we fix thousands of type errors. So gradual typing uh, in Python is implemented with a simple rule. Only functions with type annotations are checked. A function that has no annotation is considered to take any, return any, 
and the body of it isn't even checked at all. Nothing inside, the type checker won't even look at anything inside the body of a function without type annotations. So this rule allows us to introduce type annotations where we're ready to deal with the consequences, step by step, function by function. And of course, there's a network effect as we add more and more type annotations. So we annotate one module, and we will catch some type errors in internal calls within that module, maybe some calls to standard library functions. And as we annotate more modules, we'll be able to catch more and more uh, type errors in calls between those modules. And of course, the number of errors we can catch increases super linearly with the network effect. You want to start with your most used uh, functions or modules uh, because that's where you'll get the most immediate benefit from type checking. And you'll want to use continuous integration to defend your progress. Once you've started adding type annotations and fixing type errors, you really want to make sure that nobody's adding new type errors back into that same code. So you'll want the type checker running in your continuous integration to prevent that. MyPy also provides a lot of options for st various strictness levels. Uh, and you can apply those options per module. So once you have a module that's fully type checked, all the functions are type annotated, there's no type errors, you can tell MyPy, uh, don't allow any untyped function to be introduced into this module from now on uh, and protect your progress that way. You can even go one step further and say, don't allow any usage of the any type within this module if you really want to keep it strictly typed. So that's all great. There's still a problem. I mentioned at the beginning of the talk uh, how painful it can be if you come back to code that you're not familiar with and you try to figure out what types some function can take. And this may require digging through layers and layers of code to find all of the call sites of the call sites of the call sites. It turns out that this painful process is exactly the same painful process that you have to go through when you're adding type annotations to code. You're trying to look through it, you're trying to understand what are the types. What could be passed in here? How do I type annotate this correctly? How do I know if I am type annotating it correctly? Maybe I'm adding a type annotation, but it doesn't actually match what I'm doing uh, in production. So our CTO at Instagram, Mike Krieger, was actually the first person to dive into type annotations at the beginning of last year and tried annotating one of our big core modules, a thousand lines of code or so, and came back two weeks later and was like, I'm done, this is ridiculous. Uh, so he suggested that maybe we could build something that would trace uh, at runtime what types were being passed into all of our functions and then dump that information out in a really usable way to make it much easier to add accurate type annotations. So a couple of us set out to build that and it turned out to work great. And last fall we released it as open source so you can also use it, it's called monkey type. So an example of how you could use monkey type, pip install monkey type of course, and then you can use monkey type run to run any script. It could be your tests, or it could be any other script that exercises your code, or there's even ways you can install it uh, to run in production, which is what we do at Instagram. We sample a small percentage of production requests and run them under monkey type tracing. Once you've collected some data using monkey type run, uh, monkey type tracing, then you can run monkey type stub, some module, and it will print out a stub file, just like the PYI files we saw earlier, uh, that's directly usable and it will show exactly what types were recorded at runtime when your code ran. And then if you want to go further, you can use monkey type apply and take that stub and it will apply it to your code and rewrite your code with the type annotations applied. Then you can review that, uh, commit it, and your type annotated. So what's coming next in the world of Python typing? Uh, we already mentioned, uh, yeah, in, in Python 3.7, there will be a future import that will allow you to get rid of um, some ugly string forward references that are currently necessary when you have circular type references in your code. So that's one thing that's coming. Um, potentially in the future, this isn't for sure yet, but we may be able to also uh, get rid of some of these extra imports from the typing module like the capital D dict and instead just use the lowercase dict that's already built in in our type annotations. There's also a PEP that was recently accepted for a standard for how to bundle type stubs with third-party packages, which will make it much easier to distribute uh, type annotations with your libraries on, on PyPI. Conclusions from our experience at Instagram over the last year. Type check Python is here, it works. Uh, there are some warts still, but it's been very productive for us uh, at, in production use. Uh, we prevent uh, landing diffs in our code base if they have type errors, so we're using 
uh, type check Python actively in development every day. Um, our experience also is that developers love it. Um, we've received basically no pushback from anyone in our team of hundreds of developers working on our Python code base, and our type coverage has grown almost entirely organically as developers choose to add type annotations because they see the benefits of reading and maintaining code that has annotations. Using monkey type, you can annotate large legacy code bases. Uh, we've gone from zero to about half of our million and a half lines of Python code annotated uh, over the last eight months, uh, mostly by using monkey type. So it's early days, it's far from perfect, uh, but it is good enough for use. And it will get better in the future, it's being actively worked on. A few thanks before I go uh, to the team at Dropbox for creating and maintaining MyPy, which has been a critical tool for us and to everyone in the Python community who's contributed to writing and reviewing typing peps. I should mention quick, uh, we did recently switch at Instagram from MyPy to a new type checker, Pyre, that was developed by a team at Facebook, mostly because it's faster for very large code bases. Uh, so if you have a very large code base or you wanna uh, experiment with alternatives, you can also uh, try Pyre. Uh, for our code base, MyPy took about five and a half minutes, and Pyre takes about 45 seconds for a full from scratch type check. If you're working with type check Python, there's lots of resources available. I won't list them all uh, out loud in detail, but uh, both for MyPy and for Pyre and for the reference standards, and there's real-time support in Gitter, um, the PEP, uh, places you can file issues, um, monkey type issues uh, on GitHub as well. And that's it. If you uh, would like to follow up with me afterwards and uh, explain to me the many failings of this talk, I would welcome that. I'm uh, Carl JM on almost everywhere, except, of course, on Instagram itself, where I was too late to the game. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'll be taking questions outside in the hallway after the talk if you want to chat. I'd love to talk to you. Thank you very much.